This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're on part 90 of understanding the kingdom. I think years ago I had one guy write me, says, let's take it to 100. We're only 10 away from that. And so I, I think it's going to be easy. Um, as I was putting this together, the Holy Spirit had me take, took me in a whole different direction than I was intending on going at all. And so this is probably going to end up being a multiple series. Uh, but it's entitled, Moving Out of Babylon and Pressing into the Kingdom. And I don't really think we realize just how much Babylon has, has seeped into every aspect of our culture to include much of the church. It's frightening. And, you know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, and there's actually two competing leavens in the world. Prior to Jesus, the only leaven that was referred to spiritually was the leaven of Mystery Babylon. That was it. And Jesus brought a new leaven that's supposed to percolate through the whole lump. But we need to look at the reality of the times that we were living. That we're living, and I remember back in the '90s, I had uh, with, with, with the seminary. I constantly get people sending me books, and a uh, great way to build a library pretty quick, too. By the way, uh, one of them was from a missionary that, uh, because of his situation, he never had to come back to America to raise funds. He was just simply on the mission field in Europe for 30 years. Now, can you imagine being gone out of America since the early 60s before the hippie revolution? It wasn't a hippie revolution. It was an occult revolution. In fact, I was, uh, in doing some of the research that I did for the Shiner Directive, I was reading a book on, um, oh, the guy... Jack Parsons Laboratories, and it was on Jack Parsons. And so there was a guy that was in the mystery religions riding on Jack Parsons because he was an occultist, and he was a protege of Aleister Crowley. And they were commenting on the 1960s how that he would, Aleister Crowley would view that as a satanic revels. The whole time it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And he says, that's basically what they do at their satanic meetings just about. And then he goes into how so many of those that were involved in it that transformed culture from the Beatles to many of the rock and rollers were all students of Aleister Crowley. And so going from before that, so leave it to Beaver, he comes back in the 90s as a missionary, and he is in culture shock. And he wrote a book called America Has Become Neo-Pagan that its predominant religion is paganism because paganism can be anything from uh, a Satanist or an occultist to an atheist because many of the historical atheists were, were actually occultists in the background. There was in Sir Francis Bacon and many of them that, that uh, were a part of the formation of what we now know as Freemasonry and the Rosicrucians and all these different things. They were all occultists in the back. So while they're denying publicly the God of the Bible, 
they are actively communicating with other spirits behind the scenes, okay? And they're transforming culture. And so he comes back and says, the church has lost its way, that we have lost our effectiveness in our culture. We, we no longer preserve it. It's now put a ring in the, church, uh, the nose of the church, and it's leading the church around instead of the lordship of Christ and how true he is. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And I, I know when some of the things that we're going through, we need an uplifting message. But before we can be uplifted, we really need to know where we are. You know, you got to recognize, one of the things Mary and I have found in ministry, until somebody recognizes they're about to drown and get sucked up in the miry clay, you can't convince them they want out of the miry clay. And they will pull you in rather than reach for a hand to get out and get mad at you because how dare you say I'm in miry clay and they're up to it to about right here and they're denying its existence and we have a lot of that going on today Jesus said you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost its it has become tasteless how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be trodden out and trampled under the foot of men and that's a lot of where the church is today, that we are supposed to preserve culture, that we are the conscience of the culture around us. The last thing we want is for Washington, D.C. to regulate our conscience because they don't have one. Absolute power can corrupt absolutely that's one of the reasons in america we have something to call the constitution and the constitution is about controlling government and setting the boundaries on government to establish and protect the essentials which are personal liberties and now we're hearing concepts like well the constitution is an idea no it's not it's set in granite jack but it's, we've done the same thing with the Word of God. Well, we can just dismiss half, you know, three quarters of the Bible. It's nothing but stories. If you make the Old Testament nothing but stories, then you make the life of Jesus nothing but a story, and eventually it comes out to where it's all just a fable. Or is this literally the written Word of God? In America, the church is being persecuted today, and how many know there's persecution going on? Under the Obama administration, we were told that we have the freedom of religion in your church building. Could you imagine telling a Muslim that they only have the freedom of religion in a church building? Or, or telling an atheist he only has his freedom to believe what he believes in his own buildings? That's not what the Constitution says, but there was this beginning of this persecution. And now they're going as far as saying, if you're a real Bible-believing Christian, you have no right to serve in government. When there is actually an amendment to the government, there can be no religious test for service in the government. Now, back then it was, you have to allow somebody besides a Christian to be in office. <laughs> now it's been reversed. They're doing the opposite. And, and part of the reason, guys... We're being persecuted today not because of our effectiveness, but rather because of our ineffectiveness. We've let everything get rancid. Now, we have fallen in love with the wealth of Laodicea. In fact, Laodicea has rewritten the gospel by an overemphasis on prosperity. I remember in the, it went from God you know, wants to be involved in helping meet your everyday needs. Because I've, I've been in this thing, I'm, I'm long in the tooth enough, I remember when there was just the simple concept, God loves you, and God wants to meet your needs. And somehow it's gone all the way over that you're not walking with God, and you're not blessed of God unless you're a millionaire. 
Well, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to disappoint because there is not a biblical life jet. I'm waiting for the biblical life portal where I can just simply portal someplace or I want to build me a TARDIS maybe, I don't know. But I'm not interested in those things. I'm interested in getting out the gospel. And by taking something over to the extreme, it warped. You know, if we're going to believe in raising a lot of funds, how about feeding a lot of babies? Okay. Doing a lot of things. That's, I think that's one of the reasons we, although Mary can tend to make things pretty, we're very utilitarian about what we do and make sure that we stretch out and be accountable for the money that God has given us. We've also allowed Hollywood to set the trend uh, rather than the kingdom. We are more concerned with public persona than we are with personal holiness. It's all about the hype. It's all about the presentation. Don't let anybody know. How many old preachers have problems? Listen, I'm behind the scenes. I'm there talking with bishops over the years. I'm there talking with ministries that have 10,000 on Sunday morning. And for, for some reason, Mary and I have this spill your guts anointing. I never have really completely figured it out. But it, it's like they get you alone and here's all my dirty laundry. What do you think? I'm going, holy cow, we need, to, we need some bleach and some cheer and some shout it out and Oh my goodness, I, I, I've heard some things. I've walked out of meetings and I'm going, oh, you're in ministry. This is going on. This is what you're struggling with. But sometimes it puts our own struggles in perspective. Let me know everything's relative. You think you got problems. Let me tell you something. It's all relative because give you 10 minutes of talking with people and you'll find out that what you went through and what, and what the problems you have are insignificant compared to what so many others have gone through. And Mary and I have listened to people with sharing what they have gone through and it will bring you to tears. It will bring you to your knees. And I thought I had a rough childhood and I'm thinking, oh my God, I had a heyday compared to what some have gone through. But instead of dealing with it, we put on the Laodicean veneer. Everything's great, can't you see? We have a cathedral. We have this. We have that. Well, Laodicea thinks money can mimic spirituality. And it has in so many corridors. We will let Hollywood to set, set the stage and guys, we are guilty of allowing Gnostics into the fold because they're dynamic and entertaining. Give me a word. I'll tell you what, I've heard some words. I just shake my head and say, how in the world? Even contradicting Jesus in the written Word of God. Let me tell you something. I love the Word of God from Genesis 1-1 all the way through the book of Revelation. But the words in red. Oh my they have special significance to me. Because Messiah proves all things. How many know Moses and Messiah were in perfect harmony with each other? And Messiah, Messiah when he would come, he was actually correcting their misinterpretations of Moses. And if Jesus was here today, he would be doing it quite a bit with the, with the church today. Right now, where we are in America, and I'm, I'm sure that other nations are seeing that, but the, the, the prize for all of Marxists was America. Lenin even wrote that what he was doing in the Soviet Union would not accomplish the communist task, that he had to take a nation that was not a monarchy like they overthrew in Russia, but a capitalist nation that they could overthrow. Only then could they achieve their utopia. So America has always been that gem that they have been after. And guys, we are presently find ourselves in a Marxist revolution in which they are, they are literally attempting to recreate the gallows of Haman for the body of Christ. In fact, if you can tell, I'm already beginning in research mode for my next book, and God always has a way of getting stuff into my hands. And one of them I got free this week was Brainwashed America, 12 historically documented tactics actively used by the communists to capture the minds of Americans and to collapse the United States from within. Guys, they predicted this in the early 1950s and boasted, we're not going to have to fire one shot to take you over. 
One morning you're going to wake up and you are us. Man, we're awful close to being there right now. And part of it is the church's fault. Because we have not presented God's standards and God's ways. Do you know capitalism will not work? Now everybody will edit it right there. Without the moral foundation of the Word of God. Because greed takes over. But I may have ever heard, you know, America is capitalist and we're greedy. You ever heard that? I had a friend, Randy Conway, send me six conundrums of socialism in the United States of America. Number one, America is capitalist and greedy, yet half the population is subsidized. How can you have subsidized population and we're capitalist and we're greedy? And half the population that is subsidized think that they are victims. They think they are victims, yet they, they, their representatives are the ones running the government. And their representatives that are running the government, yet the poor keep getting poorer. Have you noticed that? Maybe we have the wrong leaders. The poor get, get, keep getting poor by American standards, yet they have things that people in other countries only dream of. And this is the icing on the cake. They have things, the poorest of us in America have things that other countries only dream about, yet they want to make America more like other countries. You know, we, we, have, a, we have a colloquialism in the Ozgars called stuck on stupid. That's being stuck on stupid. Everything's relative. We need to open our eyes. We need to understand that every aspect of our culture, we have failed to be a preserving and sanctifying influence in culture. I remember reading a quote from John Lennon. I'm going to quote a Beatle. You know, Jesus, when he was kind of rebuking the Essenes, and he said, uh, the, the children of this world many times are smarter than the children of God. And he was actually kind of rebuking the Essenes a little bit. Lynn said, either you change culture or culture changes you. And in the 1960s, that was a cultural revolution to completely change culture. In fact, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, at one time was the President of Princeton, and he said our goal at Princeton is to make the graduates completely different than their parents. That's how long some of this stuff has been going on. And the church just keeps marching on and doing what we're doing, but are we really doing what we're supposed to be doing? Let's go to Revelation chapter 18. I'm going to be reading a little bit of Scripture today because I hate when people take a theological snippet and take it out of context. You always got to see the context in which it was written in. And how many know that one of these days, gold and silver, you know, everybody's trying to get a hold of gold and silver and everything else. One of these days, it's going to be worthless. God is going to judge Mystery Babylon. And Mystery Babylon, although America is very much a part of it, so is Europe, so is China, so is the Soviet Union. It is the world system separated from the kingdom of God. And right now there's a fight going on on who is going to be controlling Mystery Babylon. Is it going to be America? Is it going to be Israel? There are a lot in Israel, Kabbalistic Jews, that want to control the world. There are occultists doing the same thing. We're seeing the expression in the Western society through Freemasons and a lot of them. And then you also have the Eastern world, the Middle East, or not the Middle East, but the Eastern world, China, Russia. And there, so there's these, there's these competing factions. Who's going to be the next one who is going to control the new, new world order? Because we're, we're seeing a lot of things about QAnon and that the new world order is collapsing. I've been saying that for years. Of course it is. For the new, 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 new world order that will be in a better position to bring forth the Antichrist. Okay. 
Our hope is never going to come from a man. Our hope is never going to come from a political movement. Our hope is never going to become from a nation. Our hope has to be the kingdom of God and our influence on that nation to save it from itself. Okay? Starting in verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I think that's an interesting word, sensuality. What is the first thing that they teach you in advertising? Sex sells. And now we're in our crazy culture, we're now trying to sensualize kids as young as four and five. It's all a part of the perversion of what God meant to be precious and wonderful. The enemy always perverts it and corrupts it. And he said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So my people are still in the midst of all that ugliness. So much so that it has become a prison. Well, what's a prison? You know, you can find some crooks out in public, but there's a place where you're always going to find a concentrated level of them. It's called prison, okay? Mystery Babylon has become the prison place, the consecrated place to where there are very few that are not. Mystery Babylon. And yet God has got to tell his people, y'all need to get out of that. You know, one of the things when Ezra and Nehemiah established the synagogue in Babylon, and, and it was dynamic, they knew that they culturally as a people, they had to, they, they couldn't keep their feasts the way they wanted to. They, they, they were losing their identity as the people of God. And so they went from just meeting three times a year for the feasts to meeting each Sabbath, but they would build the synagogues on the outside of the city of Babylon to remind them we're not a part of that. We're called to be over here on the outside. And that's when the Torah readings went from a three and a half year cycle to a one year cycle was because of Ezra Ezra and Nehemiah. But they did, they, they reminded the people we're on the outside of Babylon because as they would enter, they would count the dragons on the Ishtar gate. They they would look for signs. They were taught by Moses, look for signs. And the numeric value of the number of dragons that was on the Ishtar gate, there's only one word in Hebrew that has that numeric value, Hades. They literally were walking into the gates of hell when they walked into Babylon. And it was covered with dragons. And Babylon is filled with the dragons and those that follow the dragon. He said, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven. Could you imagine that sins have piled up so high they're about to crest over and to spill into the seal of heaven, the third heaven? You see, I am going to deal with this. Unless sins are repented of and covered and destroyed by the blood of Jesus, they remain from generation to generation to generation. And so lands can be filled with iniquity force that when people begin moving on those lands, that begins to percolate through them. That there are, you know, there's principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, there's wicked spirits, and they can take over geographical areas because those areas have been so piled up with iniquity and sin that gives that spirit, that becomes a dominant force 
in that city, in that area of that city. And if you ever have spiritual discernment and you're moving, and you're driving through a city, sexualization and prostitution can control one part. Another part, it's addiction. Another part, it's greed. Another part, it's some other vice that's going on. And it will take over certain part. Now, there are, there are also spirits that will add to the predominant spirit. But they take over areas. That's why it's so important to pray over the area that you're living. And if you own property, you go and anoint the four corners of your property, you dedicate it to Jesus, and you ask that Jesus would forgive any sins done on that prophecy, from that property, property from now since the beginning of time, all the way to now. You got to cleanse it because everything that goes on in the spirit realm is legal. While they're telling us, don't get into legalism, the devil is a legalist. He's an attorney. He is a prosecuting attorney. That's what Hasatan means. The prosecuting attorney. Because you want to affect that property, not have what's been done in the past on that property begin affecting you and your family. And it's the same thing for our cities because those sins have piled up all through the first heaven, second heaven, and it's beginning to creep into the third heaven. That's when God judges. It's like humanity's trash is beginning to spill over into the third heaven. Selah. That's a Selah moment. And God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid. Give her back double according to her deeds. And the cup that she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her to the degree that she has glorified herself and lived sensually to the same degree. Give her torment and mourning. For she has said in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine and she will burn up with fire for the Lord who judges her is strong. And in that moment, you know if you're going to have to come out of her then, which I don't think is really that far away, how about coming out of her now? You know, you don't want to go out of Babylon with your seat of your pants on fire. It's better to stand off afar and look at it and be a part fully established in another kingdom. Because there's only two kingdoms that you can operate on in planet earth. I don't care the name of the nation. You're either in mystery Babylon or you're in the kingdom of God. There is no other place. Now let me ask you something. What are we preaching today? Are we preaching kingdom or are we preaching salvation? From a very minimalist point of view. In Mark 1, 14 and 15, it says, Now after John had, was taken into custody, Jesus came to Galilee and preached the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. All throughout the gospels, the gospel is connected to the kingdom. Now what's crazy, what's radical is Jesus came to God's covenant people and said, you're not in the kingdom that you're going to have to repent because the kingdom is just about on you. It's getting ready to come. Are you ready? Whew. Now, one of the things I have learned about human nature is we tend to reduce everything down to where we want it, to where we can control our universe by one button. I remember when the first computers come out of the old notebook computers I had, you had more ports on it, and there's like 90 different kinds of ports, and the, your cell phone had all these different ports, and there was a plug-in for this and a plug-in for that, and there were buttons, and there were dials, and there were clicks, and there were snaps. I mean, all, those, all that's gone now. They've gotten rid of all that because it's human nature to try to simplify everything and reduce it down into something very simple. And uh, 
Guys, we have done this with, I remember, you know, I've got my smartphone up here. This thing right here has one itty bitty port on it. Just one, not 10, not 15, and a couple of buttons and they're trying to figure out how to get rid of those. They want it to be buttonless, plug-inless. You just walk into your house, it sinks, it powers up. You don't have to do a thing. Guys, we have done that to the gospel to the place that it's no longer the gospel. Now, the evangelical church has been involved in reductionism. We have reduced the gospel of the kingdom. You see, the kingdom means something completely different than just getting saved. If I had a dollar... For every time when I'm trying to explain the Word of God, and I have somebody say, but that, doesn't, that, that has nothing to do with salvation, I don't have to do that to be saved. If I had a dollar, I could take everybody here to Red Lobster three times a day the rest of my life and still have change left over. We have reduced everything to a salvitic issue when it's not. It's not... What little thing, what minimum thing that I can kind of squeak in there and God doesn't know that I'm there and the devil doesn't know that I'm there. Can I get in and maybe make it to heaven and we're going to make that the gospel message. The early church, according to Jesus and the apostles, you're either all in or you're not in at all. Living in a day that Caesar controlled everything so much so that people worship Caesar as a deity. You, you, guys, you, you cannot separate the book of Revelation with the time that they were living in. They lived in a time that unless you worship the emperor, you were an enemy of the state. Christians were being persecuted because they said, we, we will obey laws, we'll be moral, but we will not worship anybody but Jesus. It was a threat to the state, just like it's a threat to the state in China, and it's beginning to be a threat to the state in Washington, D.C., and it's a threat to the state in many other areas. We're beginning to see that unfold. They knew that to follow Jesus, you had to take up that crucifixion stick and carry it daily. Jesus would say outrageous statements like, if you put your hand to the plow to follow me, and you look back, you're not even worthy of me. Outrageous by our standards, but it's the gospel standard. Because there was the kingdoms of this world that Lucifer is God of, and there is another kingdom that he was calling us into outside of that completely, and you had to renounce all allegiance to this kingdom to be a part of this kingdom. That's the gospel. Man. In fact, John Wesley and John Fletcher warned back in John Wesley's day the, the dangers of easy believism, which is also connected to antinomianism. Now we're going to get into exactly what those mean. In fact, there's a great article, and guys, I, I'm an equal opportunity offender. When I, when I usually get through... And all the people that watch on, on TV and stuff, I offend everybody because I just stick with the word, okay? And so I'm going to offend some people today, and I'm going to offend Pentecostals and dispensationalists. I want to make sure I don't leave anybody out, okay? And this is from this article called Two Fathers of Easy Believism in the Modern Day. And uh, he starts out by saying, A.W. Tozer wrote about the type of easy believism gospel that ruined multiples, multitudes of evangelical churches in his time. Right after the first of World War II, there broke out an a epidemic of popular evangelism with the emphasis being upon what was called positive gospel. And the catchwords were believe, 
program, vision. The outlook was wholly objective, then the author puts in his own parentheses. Objective refers to what God has achieved through Christ's death and resurrection with no emphasis on practical human response. So, I ain't got to change. It was all done by Jesus. Men fulminated against duty, commandments, and what they called scornfully a dialogue of don'ts. Do you hear that today? A dialogue of don'ts. They talk about big, lovely Jesus who came to help us poor but well-meaning sinners to get the victory. And the message was so presented uh, to encourage as a loaf and bread attitude toward Christ. That part of the New Testament, which acts as an incentive toward holy living, was carefully edited out. This is A.W. Tozer. To get my place again. It was said to be negative and was not tolerated. Thousands sought help who had no desire to leave all and follow the Lord. The will of God was interpreted as, come and get it. Christ thus became a useful convenience, but his indisputable claim to lordship over the believer was tactfully canceled out. Hmm. Much of this is now history. The economic depression of the 30s helped to end it by making the huge meetings which propagated unprofitable, but its evil fruit remain, and the stream of gospel thought has been fouled, and its waters still muddied. Now, two of the modern ones that introduced that, and there were others. One of them was a guy named Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaffer known as the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. And so he embedded it, easy believism, into dispensational teaching. Which is very convenient if you take D.L. Moody's blend that grace is irresistible, or it's, it's not irresistible, but it is irrevocable. He only was half Calvinist. Before he, he was half Arminius, and half, when he went over to fellowship with, with Charles Spurgeon, and they had the great revivals that was in the UK, when D.L. Moody went over there, he began fellowshipping and hanging around with Spurgeon, and he liked this irrevocable part, but he, he, he was Arminianistic enough not to say it was irresistible. Which means, you know, basic Calvinism is... God chose you before the universe to get saved. A bunch of people, he said, you're never going to get saved no matter how much you cry out to Jesus. And only those that he chose get saved. And once you get in, you can't get out because you had nothing to do with it. It was all God. And Arminius looked at that and said, that's crazy. That I have a responsibility. I've got to yield to the gospel, surrender to Jesus. And if I deny him... I can lose my salvation, which the book of Hebrew talks about. And contextually, that's exactly what happened. They denied Christ in the synagogue to get back in. And the writer of the book of Hebrew said, what other sacrifice? You, you have denied the only sacrifice that was available to get you in. And so all this was blended together. So in other words, if I make a five-second five decision to follow Christ, I can act like the biggest poop head on the planet and still expect to go to heaven. Let me tell you something. You're going to burn in hell. The other one. And what's interesting is E.W. Kinney would not be considered a Pentecostal because he believed that the day of Pentecost is when they got saved, and so they got saved and filled on the same day. He was very Baptistic in that relation. But the faith movement and all of them took E.W. Kenyon. E.W. Kenyon really postulated easy believism. Now, easy believism is a false doctrine that salvation can be received by believing in Christ without repenting and turning away from sin. How can you believe in somebody and still embrace that which he hated vehemently? Yet, isn't that what's being taught today? We have, we, have, we have took our bulldozer to that narrow gate and we have tried to make it a 16-lane highway, but no matter how much of the boundaries that we tear down in our own effort, heaven still recognizes the original boundaries. 
Antinomianism, another big word. It is a false doctrine that believes that the law of God has been done away with and is opposed to the law of God. And you know who, who was teaching on it? it? was a guy named Jesus. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. I want to put this back into context because Jesus, I marvel at Jesus. In fact, he's the only one greater in the Bible than Moses. Oh, Mike, you have really gone off the deep end. The writer of the book of Hebrews said that Moses was a faithful servant. But there was one named Jesus who was greater because he was a faithful son. But when you get in the book of Revelation, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb are a duet. Boy, isn't that theologically inconvenient for much of the church? And so Jesus... The rabbis of his time were already replacing the law of Moses with oral Torah, oral traditions. In fact, if you've ever read parts of the Talmud, you'll hear, Rabbi so-and-so said, Rabbi so-and-so said, Rabbi so-and-so said, Rabbi so uh, ad nauseum until you actually get to the quote where either they apply a new law or they just kind of run it off the rails as far as I'm concerned. And... I, I actually study Jewish scholarship. And some Jewish scholarship is very honest. Like they always talk about the great council after the Babylonian captivity. There's no evidence it existed. It was created to, to withstand apostolic authority that the church had. They had to create that. And... Moses nowhere said, you know, I just don't have enough time in the day. You know, I've written these five books, but I should have written 40. So I had all these guys sitting around me, and I just taught them everything else I didn't have time to write down. Well, if you have time to teach it, you have time to write it. You know, even many of the prophets had a secretary. We call them scribes. You know, they wrote, uh, you know, Isaiah didn't write his prophecies. He had a scribe. Ezekiel didn't have prophecies. He didn't write. He had a scribe do it. Doing his, he was too busy having a vision. <laughs> okay. Moses could have done that. Then we would have had the 42 books of Moses instead of the five, but that didn't exist. It didn't happen. And I'm reading this one Jewish scholar from a Jewish seminary, and he was saying that in the second temple period time, which is New Testament times, by the way, that you had the aristocratic Jewish population that were very literate. They would go through either the school of Shammai or the school of Hillel. Very literate. Uh, Paul was literate in, in Greek, Hebrew. He was, he was literate in, in not only in the Torah, but in all Greek philosophy and the foundations of what became the Roman Empire, which positioned him perfectly to be the rabbi to the Gentiles. Okay? But there was another portion of the population that were illiterate, but they were rabbis. And so they would, they would have to, they couldn't read Moses. They had to memorize the scripture that they heard somebody else read to them, as well as their commentary. And so this is what Rabbi so and so said this meant. And this is what Rabbi so and so, that Rabbi so and so, that Rabbi so and so, that Rabbi so and so. Well, you know, how good does that work? Have you ever seen a thing in school where you start on this end of the, the classroom and my dog is purple and you get down on this one and it's my hot rod goes fast? Because it's word of mouth. We, we kind of have that with oral Torah. But they begin moving that oral Torah is superior to Moses. That's why Jesus said, you wouldn't hear Moses, you won't hear me. And even the Encyclopedia Judaica says that modern rabbinical Judaism is a blend of traditional Judaism and Hinduism and a lot of other isms. Well, Mike, are you picking on it? Everybody needs to repent. We all need Jesus, okay? We all need to repent. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We have allowed mystery Babylon to creep in. And it's time to run back to the Word and run back to Jesus, okay? So Jesus confronting these guys. He's talking to the congregation. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward are rivaling wolves, ravenous wolves. You know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, 
nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree brings forth good fruit, and every bad tree brings forth bad fruit. Every good tree that cannot, that cannot produce, uh, can, a, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Simple, isn't it? But that's kind of complicated. How many times have we seen uh, movements in the body of Christ, and a lot of them are very demonstrable on Facebook, that are producing bad fruit? But because they have a big following, nobody has equated it with bad fruit because you can't have bad fruit and have that many people following it. Yes, you can. In this time and, and, and day, there's more people following bad fruit than there are people following good fruit. I'm gonna, I know I'm going to get emails about that, but that's why God put a delete key on my keyboard. Okay. So then you will know them by their fruit. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. They think they're saved. They're calling me Lord. They'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of the Father who, who is in heaven will enter. Oh, you got to believe. And then you got to put feet to your belief. You got to put action to your belief. There's stuff we got to do. Oh. You got to squeeze through that narrow gate. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? I mean, come on, Lord, I was on Facebook. Did you see how I dominated Twitter and YouTube? I was invited to the biggest conferences. People would pay me big dollars for every prophetic word that I gave. That's a warning sign right there, by the way. No, that's no, no, we're, no, I'm not gonna mess with that right now. <clears throat> Did we not cast out demons? Oh, they were Pentecostals, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. King James, workers of iniquity. Now, are you ready for this? Remember, I said antinomianism? The Greek word for lawlessness or iniquity is antinomia. It is the word we get antinomian from, okay? And this is, this is from the enhanced strongs. It is a condition of without law. Being ignorant of it because of violating it or contempt and violation of law, wickedness, and iniquity. In other words, Jesus said, I'm going to cast you out and say you violated the commandments of God as a lifestyle. You didn't know me. You see, if you, know, if you knew Jesus, Jesus isn't the marginal Jew. He is the perfect Jew. He obeyed the commandments perfectly. The reason that his ministry was three and a half years is the original Torah cycle was three and a half years. He lived it before the people for an entire Torah cycle as established by Moses. Almighty God came down and says, listen, you guys don't get you. I'm going to give my life for you so that you can be set free. But you're still not getting. You have complicated. You have added all this stuff to what Moses said. And I'm going to come and I'm going to live it before you for three and a half years so that you can see how I intended for you to live it. Not what everybody else says, but the way that the one who gave it. Moses was not the law giver. He was the secretary of the lawgiver. It was dictated to him by a guy named Jesus. It was a Christophanes. Yahweh Elohim is Jesus. And I don't care how much Hebraic heritage you get, if you start denying that Jesus is Yahweh Elohim come in the flesh, it's another gospel. Read 1 John, Jack. He's very, very adamant about this. Now let's go to Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 22. Oh, you're just preaching legalism. No, I'm preaching against easy believism. It costs you, it's getting saved, believing in Jesus, costs you everything. Because unless you confess that He is Lord, you're not saved. 
That means he's Lord and you're not. The earth is not Lord. He is. And if the entire world disagrees with Jesus, you should be counted among the few, the brave, the proud, his marines that believe in him. Christianity is not for wimps. It's for the transformed. Have you found Luke yet? Starting in verse 22, And he was pressing through from one city and village to another and teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved. Now, many would write, uh, stop right there and say, Jesus prophesied one day there'll be the internet and there'll be preachers and churches on every corner and they're going to make the way wide for all who would believe to come in. Isn't that what's being preached today? It's so easy, it's so easy. No, it's not. There was a time, D.L. Moody, this one woman came to him, and she was a professional dancer. And of course, you know, you know, basic Baptist doctrine, you don't drink, you don't dance, you don't play cards, you don't smoke and chew, nor date girls who do, you know, basic. And so this woman knew that, you know, here's a Baptist preacher preaching and said, you know, I, I, I don't want to see it because I, I just so enjoy dancing and going out to the clubs and dancing and stuff. And I just don't know if I can give it up. And D.L. Moody looked at her and said, you really give your heart to Jesus. After you do, you can dance all you want. With a little grin. So she went down to the altar and responded to the gospel the way that it used to be preached. She came up to him after the service and said, you dirty dog. You knew! Once I gave my heart to Jesus, I wouldn't want to dance anymore. <laughs> you see, her, the, inf the finite met the infinite. And see, when the finite meets the infinite, only the finite changes. That's the way the gospel is supposed to be. That they're never the same again. The apostle Paul said, let him who stole steal no more. And then he gets introduced to the Torah concept that you may have to go make reparations for all that you stole. That's why Zechariah said, if I've stolen and if I've taken anything wrong from any man, I'll go back and pay it double. That was a Torah principle, the law of God. I'm just throwing that in there. Well, what did Jesus actually say? But he said to them, strive, wrestle, press through. To the, to the place until you start grunting trying to get through the thing. That's what that strive means. To enter in through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Boy, that doesn't sound like a very seeker-friendly gospel to me. Once the head of the household gets up and shuts the door... And you begin to stand outside knocking on the door saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say, I do not know from where, where you are from. And then you will begin to say, Lord, we ate with you and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. I was familiar with you. I knew who you were. I you know, I even took notes during some of your messages, and, and I can show you those notes. I even joined your club. Okay. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know from where you uh, I do not know where you're for. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. Whew. How many know Jesus was a straight shooter? Oh. 
There was other, some other stuff I wanted to share there, and I have completely forgot what it was, and I didn't put it in my notes. I may pick it up next time around. You see, Jesus set the standard for what's supposed to be preached. Easy believism is not it. This is found in Matthew 24, 4 through 14. And Jesus answered and said to see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will lead many. And I think people have misinterpreted that. You know, like the, the, this one guy calls himself the Lord Maitreya. You know, the, uh, he has the Christ spirit. Many will come and say, no, Jesus wasn't the Christ and I am. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying many will come and say, I'm really the Christ, and they're going to mislead many. That's why you have so many brands of Christianity that there's, there's more of that than there are uh, flavors of jelly beans from Jelly Belly, okay? So many will come and say, I'm a Christ, and will mislead many, and you will be Hearing of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not frightened for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation or ethnos, in the Greek this is ethnos, ethnic group will raise up against ethnic group. It's a basic thing of the enemy. You know, we, we, we deal with, and there is prejudice against black people in a lot of America that, that's slowly being overcome. But what they haven't come to realize yet, that it has been fomented by the progressives. From the Civil War until Woodrow Wilson, we had an integrated military. That there was, and it was a progressive that separated out the, the black population in the army, and they had to have their own regiments. It was a progressive that did it. Look at everything that's going on in America, and this, a lot of it has been very, very tragic. But what's interesting is every place this has happened have been democratic strongholds where the mayor, the police, the chief, and many times even the police that overstepped their bounds and took somebody's life wrongly were all registered Democrats. And yet you expect them to fix it. Jesus prophesied ethnic groups will be ethnic cleansing going on, that ethnos will raise up against ethnos, and kingdom against kingdom. In many places, there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away, and many will betray one another and hate one another. Let me stop and add there, some of the worst problems in humanity either has been when a Jewish individual has rejected their Judaism for the occult. Marx, Adam Weishaupt, but on, you say, well, you're picking on Jews. Many of the greatest threats to Christianity today are were evangelical ministers that denied Christ and walked away are some of the most prominent atheists right now on the planet trying to destroy the faith. It's the same symptom. It's just two sides of the same coin. There is no way that we can point to the Jewish community without another finger being pointed back at us because we have done in many ways the same things. They've rejected Moses to a certain degree and they've rejected Jesus. In many ways, we have rejected Moses and Jesus too because we have created another Jesus, which is no more than creating an idol. Anybody feel uplifted yet? <laughs> it may have to wait to the next section. But we've got to recognize where we are. And at that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness, antinomia, being violently opposed to the law of God is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. When I start rejecting the commandments of God, it causes my love and passion for Christ to begin to dwindle, to dwindle, to wane. Not dwindle. It's not going down to dwindle. Maybe it is, but, it, but to wane. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now listen to Jesus. 
This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I do not think we're quite to the tribulation period yet because the easy believism gospel has been preached around the world, but the gospel of the kingdom has not been preached. We have preached another gospel. Sin will absolutely kill you whether you go to church or not. I've already referred to John Wesley. You know, John Wesley had an interesting experience. He was raised in a godly household. In fact, by the time he was eight or nine, his mother required him to have memorized Deuteronomy. Eight or nine years old. Knew the word. Went to university to become a minister. And he's now sitting on a boat going to America as a missionary. And there's Moravians on the boat, the, the great Hu Hut revival. He starts hanging out with them, and he starts getting convicted. He starts getting uneasy. What is this? The light finally came on. John Wesley wasn't saved. It was on that boat heading to America that John Wesley got saved. And when he exited that boat, he was a flame of fire for the kingdom of God. There are going to be a lot today. And in fact, years ago, I had one student that had prepared for ministry, went through all this stuff. He was, and live situations happened where he made wrong choices and he found himself in jail. While he was sitting in jail, a man that had pastored multiple churches, that had went through seminary, got his master divinity, realized in prison he wasn't saved. He knew about Jesus. Man, I've been hanging out with you. Boy, those loaves and bread, they were great. I've listened to you preach. You know, you preached in our streets. And, you, and, I, and I'm familiar with you, just familiar enough. How many know that there are people in our lives that we're just familiar enough, hopefully, to recognize them if we see them in public? That we've been around them a few times. That's their relationship to Jesus. And Jesus said, you ain't getting in. I want to have the relationship that I'm causing. Do you ever have... Just a little puppy that was so in love with you that they were always underfoot and you had to be careful you didn't step on them. When it comes to Jesus, I want to be that puppy. Oh, Mike, come on now. Just give me just a little bit of room, would you? I, I got to go over there. But you can come with me. <laughs> That's the way that I want to be with Jesus. That I, I want to know his voice to the place that he can whisper in the storm and I hear his voice over the storm. That's when you know you're saved. When all the world is saying, Mike, you need to turn left, you need to go this way, and boy, I tell you what, there's going to be consequences if you do it. If you don't do it, there's going to be hell to pay. And in the midst of that din and the pressure, I hear Jesus saying, you better keep the course right on, right on track, right straight. Don't go to the right hand, don't go to the left. You keep centered up on me. If nobody else follows you, and you have to have the attitude when he comes back, if nobody else on planet earth is following Jesus but me, and every, all nine billion of them are going to hate my guts. There's one that knows my name that loves me because I have followed him and I have stayed faithful. That is the heart cry of the saved. I don't argue with the Word. I seek the power of His Spirit to live the Word. You see, what we need in this great next move of God, and one of the reasons I'm dealing with all this, we've got to know where we are before we get to where we need to go. This last, and I, think, I believe that we have time for one last great revival. The Lamb is going to receive the reward of His suffering in this generation. 
that we are going to have to be 100, 1,000% sold out to Jesus. And that He is Lord, I am not. I'm not on the throne. I'm one of the ones sitting by His footstool as He rules and reigns in my life. And what He says is absolute law. John Wesley believed, and later on it began to develop what they called entire sanctification, which according to them and and his vision of it back then is you get to a place where you can't sin anymore. And although I disagree with that, as long as you're in this world, you can choose to sin because your chooser never is taken away. But you mature to the place and you have paid too great a price to be where you are to ever entertain the thought of sin. That's entire sanctification. I've come too far with Jesus. He has become so precious that this little bobble that Mystery Babylon can give me is not worth the price that I would have to pay to be separated from Him for one hour. That's the kind of believer that in the days ahead, God is going to release an unprecedented amount of power through, that we're going to enter into a time of the book of Judges and the book of Acts coming together. And there are going to be apostles and prophets that are going to raise up with a judge's anointing to set people free from the Philistines that have taken them captive. And we're going to see a great revival in the land that they are going to go if you will forgive the pun, whole hog for Jesus. All in for Jesus. And there is going to be, for this coming up generation, this is what a true Christian is. Everything else is just noise. So that they can choose Jesus over Mystery Babylon. That is where we're headed. And so God requires us to check our own hearts. Am I into easy believism where it's only the completed work of Christ, but I don't have to do anything? You can't earn your salvation, but if you enter in, you press through that gate into the kingdom, you walk and live and breathe and move differently than when you were in Mystery Babylon. You walk and talk like Jesus. Not the, not the Christianese that we do. There have been a lot of New Agers that do the lingo and have worked themselves up into ministry that are serving the devil. But to really have a passion for Jesus that every aspect of your life you serve up on a silver platter to Him and say, come and dine, Lord. Come and live. Come and breathe through me so that you could be glorified. That is the earmark of the remnant in this generation. And I ask that for each one of us and each one of us that that listens to this video, that we would have been, we'll be given the grace of God to be His remnant in this generation and to be sold out to Him and to really walk the Word the way that we see the apostles walking in the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts has not been completed. The last chapters are still waiting to be written. Because it's not the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And he's still alive and very much well in the earth today. Well, Father, we ask for that grace in the name of Jesus. And Father, help us during this Pentecost season to see what the fire of God needs to burn up in our lives so that it can burn Jesus in. Because there's a friend, there's relatives, there are those around us that are going to split hell wide open unless they can see Jesus through us. Help us to be that people by your grace and by the power of your spirit, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church.
It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that store dot biblical dash life dot com